Thank you. We are living again and again through a historical moment of increased anxiety, violence, marginalization, exclusions, and vulnerabilities within our society and around the world, primarily incited by political actors and narcissism, leading to cruel intentions and dangerous ideologies. The Holocaust not only profoundly affected the countries where Nazi crimes were committed, but it also affected many other parts of the world as it continues to be an illness of hate in our very own, the United States of America. As members of Bridgewater State University and the broader world, we must take responsibility to address the psychological impacts and its consequences, continue to commemorate memories and lives, undo revisionist and supremacist curricula, while archiving and researching the truths about our existence and how we are all responsible for dismantling hateful ideologies. We must continue to educate, organize and activate the resilience of younger generations against hostile ideologies. I want to thank Dr. Mary Grant, Senior Administrative Fellow for Civics and Social Justice at the Martin Richer Institute for Social Justice, Dr. Engleora Leff, Professor of Global Languages and Literatures. I want to acknowledge Dr. Barbara Bond for cultivating this legacy on our campus many years ago. Ms. Mary O'Neill and Ms. Laura Mulvey for all their support during the planning of this magnificent event. I also want to thank Ms. Kelsey Davis, assistant uh, at the university events office and Mr. Reed Kimball and their teams for all their support in planning today's technological logistics. And of course, I want to thank you for being here today and witnessing a once in a lifetime testimony. I want to leave you with a fragment of Eli Wiesel's Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech from December 10th, 1986. He said, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are in danger, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Whatever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Leora Leff, who will provide remarks and introduce our special guest. Leora. There we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome. And uh, thank you so much, Luis, and the Office of Institutional Diversity at the Martin Richard Institute and all of the many people who have enabled this event. And of course, our very honored and very esteemed guests, um, Alice Eichenbaum, who will share with us today her precious testimony about her own history and that of her late husband, Ray. This is a day of remembering, but also of contemplating anew the importance of memory in the face of oblivion, erasure, denial, and repression. When the Polish diplomat and resistant Jan Karski had himself smuggled at great risk to his life into Polish ghettos and an early concentration camp in 1941, so he could bring back evidence to European and American leaders of a genocide being carried out against the Jewish people, he was met with 
disbelief. Not even President Roosevelt comprehended that this eyewitness testimony could actually be true. I knew, but I didn't believe it. And because I didn't believe it, I didn't know. These words from French Jewish philosopher Raymond Marcel articulate the incapacity of human beings to believe in that which they cannot imagine, a phenomenon exemplified by the Holocaust, which transgresses all moral understanding. It is for this reason that when the unimaginable had indeed transpired and the Nazis succeeded in extinguishing nearly the entirety of European Jewry in a mere few years, that General Eisenhower, upon liberating Buchenwald with his men in April 1945, urgently cabled George C. Marshall. The things I saw beggar description, the visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me sick. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give first-hand evidence of these things if ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. How sadly right he was. The Soviets, who had already liberated Auschwitz in January 1945, were already using a primitive form of Photoshop to erase the yellow stars marking the 1.1 one million Jewish Auschwitz victims as Jews. They wanted the world to see Auschwitz not as a death factory created to annihilate the Jewish people, but as a German aggression against the heroic USSR. The moral imperative to never forget, or zachor, remember, as we say in Hebrew, quickened in the post-war years as the world learned of a genocide that had been realized not just by sins of commission, but of omission. The perpetrators abetted by those who hated more passively or those who were simply indifferent or who were happy to seize the houses and businesses now emptied of the Jews who'd been neighbors, acquaintances, colleagues. But only a few decades later, too few people are learning about or remembering what it was that was never to be forgotten. Anti-Semitism is reawakening from its only ever very light slumber to cause an exponential rise in neo-Nazi white supremacist terrorism. In Europe, neo-Nazi paramilitary groups are organizing, while actual neo-Nazi parties have entered parliaments, or in the case of Greece and Hungary, have won majority rule. Right here, the same Gildena or golden America that had harbored post-war refugees saw in Charlottesville, 2017, angry young men brandishing tortures and shouting the Nazi slogans, blood and soil, blood und Boden, and Jews will not replace us. Rabbis and Jewish students have been attacked and killed in synagogues, Jewish centers, daylight streets, or in their own homes. A woman saying the Kaddish prayer for the dead to mourn her mother in a Poway, California temple was killed while defending the rabbi from a gunman who'd prearranged his attack to simulate a video game. 
and two recently elected members of the United States Congress belong to QAnon, a group encompassing Americans from every social class and educational level whose core belief reiterates the medieval European anti-Semitic slander of the blood libel that Jews use the blood of Christian babies for their Passover matzot in seders and other rituals. This blood libel literally carved into the stowed facades of Europe's cathedrals and churches caused the righteous Pope John Paul II with great grace to ask forgiveness for the Vatican's role in perpetuating a legacy of European anti-Semitism that culminated in the Holocaust. This is a crucial time in history in which to hear from Dr. Alice Eichenbaum, a woman of extraordinary resilience, bravery, heroism, and compassion. Let us now hear her story. Ms. Alice, whenever you are ready, you can unmute yourself and you can start your, um, your talk. Unmute. Okay. There we go. Thank you so much. It's okay now? Okay, you are good to go. Thank you so much. Okay, you can take it. Okay, all right. Leora, thank you for this introduction. <laughs> um, I will tell you what I do. I divide my, my speech in two parts. I talk about myself, how I survived, and about my husband. Why I do this so you can see it depended where you were, which depended on the place, the, the people, and where we grew up. I want also to start that really the Holocaust started on November 9, 1938. On November 7th, a young uh, 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 Polish guy entered the German embassy in Paris. It was Greenspan. He demanded to talk to the ambassador. He was very upset. His parents that lived a long time in Germany were Polish nationality, were being deported. The ambassador didn't have time for him, so he sent him Van Roth, the first lieutenant. Greenspan called, just pulled the revolver and killed him. On November 9th, Van Roth, at the age of 26, passed away. That day, that day, Hitler gave orders that all synagogues, all the books of, of prayers should be destroyed, even to, to attack some businesses, but not to, to take anybody in prison. That day, it was the Kristallnacht, that is called, really officially the Holocaust started. I was born in Vienna, Austria, an only child to a middle-class family. My father had a business in Vienna and in Sofia, Bulgaria. We commuted back and forth, and somehow we settled then eventually in Bulgaria because his business was doing better there. So in 1938, when Hitler marched into Austria, that was the Anschluss, by just sheer luck, I, we were in Bulgaria, and that's the way I survived. I always give a background also about Bulgaria, but not many people don't know about it. It's a Slav, they're Slavs, they have the Cyrillic alphabet. Bulgaria had nine, nine million people, and quite a lot, and one third of the population was illiterate. When I was growing up, it was a poor country. Sofia was the capital, but the, the moment you left Sofia, there was no electricity, no plumbing, 
nor anything. We had only one highway. It was, life was very, very, very simple. I adjusted right, right away to Bulgaria. I learned the language. And looking back, I loved it. I was so happy there as a child. Life was really pleasant. I went to a private German school. We went vacation in, in, in the, on the Black Sea or in the mountains. My father did well in the business and everything was, was, was nice. We both, my father and me, we learned the language very easy. It's a Cyrillic alphabet and Cyrillic, so it wasn't easy. But being young, of course, I could, uh, could learn it. Whatever's happened in 1938, not 39 and 40, we didn't know. There was hardly any communication. Who had to tell uh, a television for sure? Though. But even the radio was a novelty or even a, tel a, tel a telephone. But we knew something was going on because my mother and father had brothers and sisters in Prague and Vienna and they were already write letters. Don't write us, we're going on vacation. We knew something was going, but we didn't know what was going on. I remember it was 1940, and somehow there were rumors that things will change even for us, for Bulgaria, for Bulgaria. We had a king, I grew up with it, Tsar Boris III, who had German ancestors. And Hitler needed Bulgaria as a strategic point to move the, the, his German troops through Bulgaria to the Black Sea to attack Russia through Ukraine. Ukraine. In March of 1941, the German troops marched into Bulgaria and Bulgaria became an ally. So we did. And things changed for me, for the Jewish people overnight. When I, First of all, I went to a German school. Already the, the flag with the swastika was flying. The teachers had already the, na the names uh, with the, the swastika and, and, uh, on the arm and Heil Hitler was always the, the story. Um, even the Bulgarian teachers were not very pleasant. They made ne negative remarks about the Jews. And all of a sudden, my classmates that we they have since kindergarten started to look with me different, different. I was Jewish all of a sudden, and I didn't belong with them. Recess, they didn't play with me anymore, and they never invited me to a birthday party anymore. Well, it's no big deal, but you can tell how things are. There were orders. The, the Germans were never in charge of us somehow. It was always the Bulgarian police. My father lost the business. Jew, Jews couldn't have business anymore. Um, doctors couldn't work in hospitals. It was every day we had different, different orders. Um, we, we started to have coupons um, and uh, curfew. After eight o'clock at night, Jews couldn't go to curfew. I had to finish, it was March, so I had to finish the school until July. And I was so unhappy because I hated to go to school with all these remarks they made against the Jews and the way they treated me, but I had to finish school. I couldn't get into a public school because there was only a quota of 7% of Jewish kids could go into public school. And I coming from a private school couldn't get in. So. Uh, my parents got me to, get me to go to a Catholic <laughs> uh, French school. I was so happy there. Unfortunately, I didn't stay too long. Too long. The nuns were so, so pleasant to us and uh, never made any different remarks and nobody was allowed to make any negative remarks at the end to Jew Jewish people. In November, in November of 40, 42, in November of 40, 42, see a year almost later, we were issued the yellow star. And it was known to all Europe. We had the smallest yellow star. It was just like a little button that we put on and sold it on on the left-hand side. If you know, in, in the West, uh, they had a big patch 
of a yellow star that they had to wear in the front, the back, and the side. And the pants where you were, if you were German, it was um, Jude and French Juive. But we had the smallest yellow star. Also, we had to put a sign on, on every apartment or house. It said Jewish, Jewish house. And all the signs went up to all the restaurants, theaters, movies, even Main Street, we were not allowed. It said uh, entrance to Jews was forbidden. But I always felt I was home. We were still home. And even if we had to struggle and it was unpleasant, but we were home, we didn't know. But it was January of 1943, uh, Hitler sent his best envoys, Dominique and Hoffman. He needed 20,000 Jews for slave labor and he wanted them from Bulgaria. Now, part of Bulgaria was Macedonia and Trace. They rounded up 12,000 Jews from there and 8,000 from the borderline, border uh, providence. They, got it, they put them into um, uh, tobacco, tobacco warehouses. But Bulgaria was a big export in tobacco, tobacco. And they kept them there. And it was February or in January, but in Bulgaria, the weather is, is extremely, is extremely uh, cold. Now, the 8,000 Jews, which were really Bulgarian citizens, uh, the church intervened and some politician intervened to the king. Eventually, he let the 8,000 Jews go, go home. But the 12,000 went on cattle car to the Danube, from the Danube to Vienna. And there the Gestapo waited for them, and they were very upset because they couldn't use them for slave labor. So they sent them almost everybody to Treblinka. Out of 12,000, only 196 survived. It was quiet a little bit, but we knew something was going on because the two envoys were still there and we were scared. We didn't know from one day to another, there were different rules. Uh, it was more curfew. Although I went to school, but after school, I had to get home immediately. Uh, no women could go shopping before there was every time there was a new rule uh, coming up. Well, eventually, uh, they, what they they they, they wanted um, the rest of the, of the fifty. We were fifty thousand Jews. That's all we were. Not that that many. They wanted them all to be transported to the West. The king, who was very sympathetic to uh, to us, I must admit, and the church. The church is Greek Orthodox. Orthodox. So to, to get a, a, a time, um, they took the 25,000 Jews from Sofia and dispersed them in small communities and built a little ghetto. It wasn't really a ghetto because we were not fenced in and we didn't have to do slave labor. We got the notice that we have 48 hours to pack one suitcase and be ready, the police will pick us up and take us to the train station. But, and the notice was we were going to Karnovat. Karnovat was a small town, never heard of it before, not far from 60 kilometers from the Turkish border. Well, the police picked us up the next day and we were not sure, we were not sure, are we going to a real train or to a cattle car? But sure enough, we went to a real train and there, there were a lot of people with the yellow scar because it was a long train that went from Sofia to the Black, Black Sea. That's the only time I saw the Gestapo with the big German shepherds and they were yelling and screaming. It was scary, believe me. Also, they checked all the IDs, they checked the IDs. Our ID was a German passport. And if they ca caught us, we could never have gone on that train to Karnabat. But somehow, by sheer luck, the, the sirens went up because the British uh, Air Force was stationed in Turkey, were coming up to go towards Germany to attack. So they had to tr get the train going very fast out of the, st out of the station. We arrived in Karnabat, 
It was a small Turkish town with still a Turkish bat and a, a minaret that chimed three times a day. First, they didn't know what to do with us because we were the first ones to get there. They cleaned out the schools and they put straw mattresses on it. And then eventually when more people came, they sent us to, there was a small Jewish community. So we were sent to, this, to each house, to, to, uh, to, that's where we were stationed. Uh, our, we, were, we had a room, there were three families. There was no plumbing and no running water. And at the, at the town. We had strict curfew. We only had from 10 to 12 to go outside. We had coupons and the coupons were less and less and less. I remember going to bed many times hungry and not knowing if tomorrow I have something to eat, you know. So I still have this, this fear of not having anything to eat after all these years. Before going to bed, I have to have something, a piece of cookie, a piece of apple, just not doing it. Maybe tomorrow I have nothing to, to eat. My mother went out shopping, and if there was anything left after 11 o'clock from the farmers that came in, and my job was to go to the well and bring two big water buckets of water so we have some water to drink or to, to wash ourselves. They were very kind, and once a month, and once a month we could go to the Turkish bath. We had to to go to the women in the morning and the men, men, men at night. We always got orders. Sometimes it took even away the two hours of freedom from, from us. I came down very sick with whooping cough, my mother with malaria. There were no Bulgarian doctor was allowed to go to a Jewish home or to treat a Jew. We had no medication, also was not allowed to us. I don't know how my mother made it because her case was really a, a tough case. But years go, went, the months went by and we really struggled, struggled from one day to another, not knowing. And three families in one room wasn't the most pleasant, uh, pleasant thing. But it was August, quite early, August of 1944, uh, I'm sorry, 44. When the police came, and every time the police came, we were scared that some new rules or they're taking away again something or not. One time we didn't even get uh, coupons. They forgot about us, who cares, you know. And tell us we don't have to wear the yellow star anymore. And we have freedom. We don't, uh, we don't have to be, uh, you know, set in the house. We can have free to get, to get out. And you know, in the first few days, nobody believed them because they thought maybe it's a trap to take us. But then slowly we realized that we are free. We didn't know why, but sure enough, on September 9th, 1944, the Russian army moved in through the Black Sea, through Bulgaria, and I was liberated. I, we went back to Sofia. Sofia was bombed and we lost everything. And we made a life for ourselves again, but it wasn't the same anymore. The same. My father had to rebuild the business. Um, all private schools closed and I went to a public school and slowly the communists took, took, took over. And the one that think that Bulgaria was a very, very good, he, they gave freedom and passage for all the Jews if they wanted to leave, you know. So most Bulgarian Jews moved to, moved to Israel, including my, my parents. I went back, I went to Vienna to study. I have a degree in chem chemistry. School was tough. I had to be tutored in mostly in chemistry and in math because to catch up. And I really graduated with my class, really, because of the, uh, the tutoring. Um, I look, at, I will talk about my husband, but I'll finish now with Bulgaria. I, I look back many times of, of my youth in Bulgaria. I loved it. I was very, very happy there. And the Bulgarians, the Bulgarians itself, were good to the Jews. 
but the Bulgarian Jews, there were 50,000 people, were not rich. They were not bankers or owned banks or had uh, big businesses and like in Vienna and in Austria. They, I assure you that none, none of them had a Rembrandt or Monet in, in their houses. Uh, so there was nothing to take. The rest was poor. They were illiterate and, and, and poor. It was also the church that helped to save us to a certain point. There was the chief rabbi was supposed to be arrested and the church took him in to give him uh, that uh, protected from, from the government. It was also the king who really to a certain point also didn't hurry to do things for the, the, the Ger German set, set, set was. And of course, I was liberated early. So these were all the factors that we always thank to the Bulgarian that the 50,000 Jews were, were, sa were safe. I went back many times to Bulgaria. I wanted my children to see where I grew up. And I always have good memories in spite some tough, tough times. But you know, you forget the bad times and you look ahead to the good, the good times. I will tell you now a little bit about my husband. He was born in Lodz, Poland. Lodz was a big textile industry and the German renamed it Litzmanch, the Litzmannstadt. He was 10 years old. He had a 14 year old brother, a 16 year old sister, a big family, a lot of uh, uncles, aunts, um, grandparents, everybody. And 1939, September, the Germans marched into Poland and he would always say, overnight things changed. As slow they were moving with me, as overnight they, moved, they went with him. Right away, the father lost the business. Jewish kids couldn't go to school. Uh, they issued him the big, big yellow star and then it was written JIT, that's Polish for, for, for Jew. In August of 1940, they established the Dlodz Ghetto, which was even bigger to a certain point sometimes that you must have heard of the Warsaw Ghetto with the up, what I rising. There were 20 to 20,000 people in there. He was 10 years old and he had to work in a tannery where they made belts for the German soldiers. soldiers. You worked, he worked from eight to five we had for lunch, they gave him a little hot soup with potatoes, which he always said were peels more than potatoes. And you got a loaf of bread for the week. You didn't work, you didn't get the loaf of bread. After they finished with the tannery and made enough belts, they sent him to a woodworking place where they cut big planks of wood. And it depends what they needed, the German. He said, we made crepes and uh, chairs, whatever they needed. The severe Polish winter and the malnutrition, people were dying right and left. First it was his, the grandparents, then the parents and some aunts some uncles, the point. Until August of 1944, the large ghetto was getting, uh, um, was resolved because the Russians were moving, were moving in. In the beginning of September of 44, remember, I was liberated. He went to Auschwitz. You know, they put him in cattle cars and they didn't know where they were going. If you were in a transport, if you were 24 hours, 36 hours, it didn't matter how long, you didn't get no water and no food, no piece of bread. After traveling for a long time, they, they, the train stopped and there was a big sign that says, Arbeit macht frei, that means work makes you free. And it was Auschwitz. Auschwitz was overloaded, so they sent him to Birkenau, which is next, next town, next to it. That's where all the children were supposed to go. But now because of, you know, overloading Auschwitz, he always said he never will forget and never did forget the yelling of people and the smell of uh, human flesh. There they separated the sister. 
So the two brothers stayed together, stayed together. And that's the last time he saw his sister. Until his dying day, he never could find out what happened to her. And he really tried many times to do it, but he couldn't find out. In Auschwitz, you didn't stay too long. You were able to work. They, they inspected you and sent you for work and you couldn't work to, it was right and left, depending what side. Right went to work, left went, went to the gas chambers. There was nothing, they didn't need them for work. So they selected him and his brother to go to work, to work. Even that he was little and malnutrition, but he said they, he didn't know why they selected him, and there was a reason for it. And he said, once we were selected for work, the Germans were very kind to us. They gave us a shower and then the striped uniforms to go. And they put a tattoo, they tattooed his number in, in it. And even when the, he lined up to take the tattoo, the, guy, the German said to him, you, well, where are they sending you? Do you wouldn't make it at all? So the other one says, give him the number. Who cares what happened to him? His number was 10308. That means 10,308 were ahead of him, whatever. They put their brother and him in a cattle car. They didn't know where they were going. But then the train stopped. They were going west, even to Redulta. It was a coal mine. And they needed him to go down in the shafts with the dynamite. That's why, because he was small. And he always said it was dangerous, but once it, he did it, it was, you know, he had free, freedom. But his brother who was older now, he had to drag that call up and down. There was no elevator, anything. They stayed there from uh, October, to March of 1945, you know. Um, then they put him on cattle cars because there the Americans were moving, moving in. And he said, we were for days on the cattle car, no food, no, no water, nothing. They didn't know where they were going. Then they saw they, they, they uh, crossed the Austrian border and it was Matt, Matthausen that they were. Now, Mauthausen was also a horrible concentration camp. It had 77 steps to go up because it was a quarry. And there you had to bring him down. And he said, people just gave up. They, they couldn't take it any, anymore. One day, he always would say, a mean German commando separated the two brothers. And I think for him, that was the hardest time. Nothing was worse than to be separated from his brother, you know. Him they put on the train and the brother they left and he always remember that he'll never forget when the train pulled out that the brother waved his last goodbye to him. The train couldn't go far because, you know, they were bombing. So they had the death march, you know. On April 30th, 1945, he woke up in the woods and the German soldiers were gone. Whoever could walk and crawl up to the highway and it was the 5th American Infantry Division. At liberation, he weighed 51 pounds. He, he, he had to go to a hospital for weeks and weeks. Also only malnutrition, also depression. He, his whole family was killed. There was nobody. He, he had nobody that, that, so, that so survived. And then he went to a DP camp, that's a displaced person camp, from there to America, because he said, you have to make a life for yourself. If not, the German one for, one for you. He was in an orphanage in New York, an orphanage in Chicago, and then he was placed in a foster home in Providence. That's where Providence comes in, you know. He went to school. He, went, he caught up, of course, missing years and years of school. But somehow he managed to, to finish high school, was drafted in the army, and 
he went to school and became a chemist also, just like me, you know. He would always, if you met him, in spite of everything and the number on, on his arm, he always smiled and had a good disposition. But trust me, he never, never could forget what happened. Everything reminded him of, how, of Auschwitz or the concentration camp. I remember one example I'll give you only, that we were on a, on a highway, and of course we had a flat tire. It was pouring rain, and I don't know why AAA didn't come. He went out to fix the tire. And when he came back, he was cold, freezing, shivering, was wet. He says, you know, that reminds me of Auschwitz. When we stood for hours and hours in the pouring rain, waiting for the German commander. But his, when he spoke in school, he always would say, enjoy life. You never know what's tomorrow. They all, he believed in two Ps, purpose and pride. I will finish here. I have much more to tell you and say, and I hope you have questions, and I'll be very happy to answer them. Miss Alice, thank you so, so much for your profound uh, remarks, for sharing with us your story, the story of your husband, for those memories that have shaped you into the person that you are. I am very thankful. We are very thankful for this once in a lifetime opportunity to hear, to hear from you, to hear uh, from a survivor. Um, uh, uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience, and I'm going to start with, with the first one. This is from Sophie, and Sophie asks, uh, I am curious to know if you were raised to be very religious, and if your religious views have ever changed due to your experiences. I was raised, uh, I had a grandmother who, which I grew up, you know, she came also from Vienna just in time. <laughs> you know, she stayed with us. She was Orthodox, you know, so that means very religious. So I, my parents were not. They were very Austrian and they wanted to blend in with the Austrian. But my house was very religious and she was a big influence to me. I am still, still religious. I still light candles every Friday night. I still have two sets of dishes. Uh, and I think it takes to my grandma, grandmother. And when my kids grow up, I made sure that they got a very Jewish education. I made sure that they went to 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 a to a Hebrew day school for the, until seventh or eighth grade anymore, you know. And to the, yeah, I still keep it somehow, um, in spite of everything. Maybe. People ask me the schools, you know, you have all these questions. Weren't you sorry that you were not, that you were Jewish with the Holocaust? I said, yeah, maybe at that moment, but I still, still was brought in a lot. My grandmother was a big influence on in me, you know, mm -hmm. to continue the, the tradition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that response, Dora. Alice, there are so many comments and I want to thank you for sharing you and your, your husband's story with us today. And in the, the chat, I know it's pretty small, but there's many comments of thanks and gratitude for you to share your story. Um, one of the questions that came up in the chat, um, Ginny has asked me to ask, when you refer to the church in Bulgaria, are you referring to the Catholic church? No, Greek Orthodox. Okay, okay. Greek Orthodox, they have the tall hats, the white thing, uh, big white crosses, they're completely different, you know? Mm -hmm. The liturgy is different, their churches are different, they have round cupboards, and they don't celebrate Christmas and Easter together with the Catholic uh, religion. Like, uh, Christmas was usually 6th, 7th of January, and Easter mm -hmm. is next week, you know, completely. Mm -hmm completely different traditions, you know. So I grew up, the house we have shared was with Bulgarian people, so I learned a lot from them, you know, about that tradition, you know. Thank you. Thank you for, for that clarification and, and kind of the, um, yeah. the breakdown of that. I think that was helpful for our audience members. There, 
There was another question here about your um, how you met your husband. Um, Anne was interested in, in hearing that story if you're comfortable. I, I tell you, I always, if Paula is laughing with that, I always leave it out <laughs> to, uh, where, where we met. You see, he, he was in America and he came to study in Europe after he was in Korea. He got the... Um, um, you know, what was it? Game, the, not the Pell Grant, what was it? GI, the GI, GI, you know, because he was a GI. But it wasn't too much money and he couldn't, you know, he had nobody here, you know, somehow. So somebody told him, come to Europe. Uh, the dollar is very strong. And with that money, you can live very well in, Aus in Austria. And so he came to, to Austria and we met at, at the school, you know. He was going into chemistry. I was almost finished. I was doing all of my last chapter of the chemistry. And that's the way we met. Mm. And he would always say, I have to say it all the time, that, you know, he was very sentimental, which I'm not <laughs> sentimental. He would always say to me, you know, after the war, there were people that met uh, that found a, a, a sister, they found a brother, they found a mother even. There was a case in Providence, they found a mother. He says, I didn't find anybody, but I found you. Mm. Mm. What a wonderful thing to remember and to hold on to as you're thinking yeah. of your husband with that. Unfortunately, he passed away very uh, young. He passed away. I'm sorry. Mm. Well, he was sick. He was, trust me, the years there in Auschwitz and all the thing played a role. He was already uh, had open heart surgery when he was 49. So, mm -hmm. but... Miss, Miss Alice, there are so many comments, so many remarks, uh, so much gratitude for your presence and so many questions too. There is one um, from Sharon and she's, She's, she's wondering, how old were you when you were liberated? 14, 14, 15. 14, 15. And then uh, as a, as a, as a follow-up question, um, what do you think young Jewish people can do today to share our culture and history with the world in a positive light? It's very hard to tell. You know, it's a different you today, you know, that when I grow up or my kids, even with my kids, it's a different change. The, uh, I don't know what the young people can do. I don't know. It's, it's very hard. You meet the young people. It's a, today a completely different perspective. The women go to work. They have high degrees. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's really hard to tell, you know. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I see my children, even. You know, my son, my oldest son, um, after they left the Hebrew day school, they didn't want to know anything about Judaism. No, they were angry, and why did you send us all these times? And they didn't want to say anything. But uh, my oldest son went to, to lived in a year and a half in Israel. And that turned him around, you know, but still not. But now he has a child and you should see how he keeps up the tradition. Now, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. he makes sure that she has Hebrew school and she makes sure they have the holidays. And now you see, I told him that's the way it is. So you have to, you have to have an example also, you know, mm -hmm. so that's the main thing. That's right. Lead by example, which you yeah, have taught us today, for yeah, sure. He does eat out. He's completely kosher, you know, to show her, to show her really, very, right? And he's very active in the temple to show her that, you know, you have to participate, you have to do. I'm, I'm really surprised sometimes how he turned 360 degrees because you have a child. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Thank you. We, we, we have a, a question from, from Anne. Anne, you raise your hand. Would you like to ask your question or your comment? 
the what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Yes. No, we're gonna. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Oh, I was man. curious what led you to um, tell your story. Why do you think it's so important that we hear your story and your husband's story? Thank you. Let me tell you something. Uh, many, many years ago, you know, uh, the first thing came out a book and somebody started to say, the Holocaust is a myth. It never happened. You know what? Um, and I remember my husband at that time got angry and said, what do you mean there wasn't here? What, look at that number. What did I put it down uh, up with the, myself, myself, something. So it is important that people should know, first of all, that there was really, really a Holocaust, you know. And second, to show what can happen. And believe me, things can happen again like this, you know. Mm -hmm. You never know. What happened in Germany was Hitler came up. It was big unemployment. People had no jobs. And he told them that if I, uh, if you elect me, I'll give you jobs. I'll make Germany a big country. And you have to have a scapegoat all the time. So he picked on the Jews, you know. So that's why I think it's very important that I tell my story. My husband was telling his story when he was still alive. So people should know and be alert to what can happen. Alice, this idea of passing on you know, your story and sharing it with, with wide groups brings us to this other question of really, you know, what is your, your concern and your hope for the future? regarding the fight against anti-Semitism and knowing that uh, people that are sharing these stories um, will not be able to share those forever directly. And how can we continue to fight against anti-Semitism going forward um, as these stories are still with us? The tough question to answer. It's really a tough question. Yeah. It depends, depends on the situation, depends on the people, depends on many reasons. I don't know. It's, it's very t tough, you know. Mm -hmm. Some people, my husband would always say that in Poland, the people were very, very anti-Semitic, very, you know. You know, you must have heard about the pogroms in, in the little towns and, and everything. So the, the joke was that the, the, they already have an, he, that's what the Jews in Poland would say sometimes. They, they have the anti-Semitism already in their mother's milk. You know, that's what mm. they're brought up like this, you know? Mm. And it can happen, it can happen, you know? If somebody's in business with a Jew and they don't do well, they can, it, it's, it can happen anytime. And how to prevent it, I don't know. How do you mm -hmm. prevent it? You know, it's- yeah. Just Mr. by luck, you can prevent it. You know, that the only thing you could prevent it when you teach your children to be tolerant to every, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if the person is Jewish or has a different pigment. That's the only thing when, from, when you get them going from the beginning, you know, to, to tell them. Mm -hmm. If they come home and say, oh, that's Jewish or that's, uh, a different race or something that at that moment you should explain to them and mm -hmm. try to teach them young and they're all right. late. it's too late you know that's right education is so important miss alice earlier when before this this conversation started i had asked you how long you've lived in providence and you estimate about 50 to 55 years you know 50 yeah. 55 years so so this question uh, aligns to that. How did you start your life again after the Holocaust? What was your experience when you came to the United States? <laughs> it, it was tough. It was a tough thing. I didn't know the language, you know, I didn't know any, any language. And it was completely different culture from Europe, you know, I mean, completely, you know, um, it was a tough situation in the beginning. Um, people 
the Europeans, uh, I mean, I talk about the Austrians because, you know, I went to school in the end, oh, the, the Bulgaria, are very polite, you know, they're polite. I found the first time the Americans were not polite, <laughs> somehow. There was a lot of co concepts that, you know, um, when we had this, uh, something that I'll never forget, um, in, in Europe, when you have a, um, sorry, I'm sorry, a, 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 a house of worship, you know, a temple or a synagogue, the president of the, of the temple has to be somebody because he, you see, the churches in Europe are government. They're paid by the government, you know, mm -hmm. so they're connected with the government. So the, the president of the temple or even a church or some, something has to be a, a, a somebody, you know, a lawyer or something because he has to deal with the government to see it to simply. And I remember I, I came to America in May and that was the first holiday we had in September. And we got tickets to a temple in, on Broad Street, on Broad Street. And the president, would you believe it was a butcher? <gasps> I couldn't believe it. I mean, that was to me, how could that happen? Have happened. And then they had, a, and then that's also, you never have this. They had a fundraiser like uh, at, at, uh, at the high holiday. And one guy said, I give hundred dollars or something. So the president said in front of everybody, what do you mean, hundred dollars? You have a gas station, you should give more. I mean, these were the little things that really <laughs> impressed me very much. I couldn't think so. And, you know, there were a lot of things. Also, life was hard in the beginning. I didn't know the language. I had a PhD, but I took my first job as a lab technician until I learned the language. And then I've worked at Brown even for two years, you know, because I know the language as research, research. But it's, it's, it was a very tough situation, very tough, you know. It's a lot of uh, culture, uh, mannerism, uh, financially was tough for us. My husband was still going to school to URI, you know. So th the first few years were not easy in America. But mm -hmm. I remember my husband taking me uh, for lunch or somewhere to a couple that were here from Germany for 10 years. And they were still complaining about the, the Americans. And I promised myself that after 10 years, if I don't like America, I'm not staying here. So I made the best of a situation. I went to ball games. I know ball game. I know everything to learn for and be an American. That's fantastic. You certainly immerse yourself into the into the mosaic of what makes us uh, Americans, right? This, yeah. this, these, these differences and uh, and enjoy the beauty of it, right? Yeah. Um, yes, I made it a point that I want to be here. That's my home now. That's the way you'll you'll do the the, the the you know the best. I always tell you, um, I always tell sometimes in school or somewhere that. I went, to, even looking back at my youth, I had an interesting youth. I, I grew up under a king, I grew up under a king. I, I went through, through the Holocaust. I was under the communist, <laughs> the communist. So I covered all aspects and I said, well, now I'm in a democratic country in America. That's the way you do. You all, the aspect of it. all those transitions. Wow. Laura, do you want to ask the yeah. next question? Yes, we have a question from a student, Alice. Um, she was asking, how many languages do you know? Do you find language acquisition very difficult? The what? Language acquisition. The what? To learn languages. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was very difficult. Oh, my God. You should see. I had my first job and I came home um, and I said to, to, to my husband, I don't know why the boss doesn't want anymore. He wants to sell me, give me a flower shop, a flu shot. <laughs> That's the way I, I knew uh, English. No, it was very hard. I had, but I, again, like I told you, 
I went to night school right away to learn English right away, you know. But then I think, but again, uh, there is an experience. When I came home, my husband uh, said to me, uh, so what did you learn today in English? I said, nothing. Why? The teacher was putting something on blackboard. She was left-handed. I never saw a left-handed person in my life. <laughs> the Europeans train their children. They give them always the right hand, the right hand. You never see you. I mean, not now. I, now I know. But when I was growing up, I never saw a left-handed person. I was <laughs> mesmerized. But I went to school right away. I told you. I made the point. If I want to stay in this country, I bet, you know, I went to ball games and everything. Okay. That's right. That's right. I, I want to continue um, stating how many uh, remarks of appreciation are in the chat. People uh, are, are saying how inspiring you are to them, how inspiring you are to all of us. Thank you for, for sharing your story. Um, uh, a couple, so we'll do maybe two more questions and then uh, we'll, uh, um, well, the questions are getting uh, bigger and bigger. So let me go with this one. Uh, Tina asks, how do you feel about the Holocaust and museum? Uh, I visited the one in Washington, D.C. and found it very powerful. Do you feel they are a good re a representation, remembrance of history, or do you think that there is a better way to learn about or to remember this time? Well, it's history, too, you know, it's part... It will be probably uh, 50 years from now, it will be part of history, like everything else, you know. And mm -hmm. it, it, it's... Um, Have you been to the museum? Which one? In Washington? No. 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 I, don't, I didn't go, you know. No, I haven't been to the museum in Washington, but people should go there, you know, okay. and, and see. That it's important that they go and show there, you know. Mm -hmm. And you should come to the museum in Providence. <laughs> That's right. Let's start with the local, right? That's the local. That's from where I'm talking, you know, the point. But you, you have to tell people they have to be exposed, you know, and be mm -hmm. told to Washington. Yeah. Did you go? I have never been here to Washington. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have not been. I don't okay. know. Okay. No, no, it's, it's, it's okay. I, we completely agree with you in that it serves as a place to continue learning histories, right? And as you said, they will become historical, uh, yeah. historical, but they will become um, even more so um, many years from now. Um, no, yeah, it will be the same like, uh, uh, you know, we covered cover chapters here, the Civil War. You know, that's part of history. Isn't that? That's right. That's right. And actually, you mentioning the uh, Civil War kind of like leads into this other question from Paulina. Um, it says, Mrs. Eisenbaum, thank you for sharing your experience with us. I believe in a powerful phrase that says, those who do not know history are condemned to repeat it. Do you think today's events related to terrorism and white supremacy in today's circumstances, especially due to huge difference in communication and social media, have resemblance or connection with what the Holocaust means to world history? I didn't get that. <clears throat> the, the events that are happening today, yeah. um, do, do, they, do they relate to what happened before the Holocaust? <clears throat> Let me tell you something. I don't get, I only speak about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You understand? I don't yeah. know. I have yeah. my theory and my thing, and I, I'd, I'd stay out. I'm sorry. That's, no, that's completely understandable. Nothing to be so about. Yeah. You know, okay. you're yeah. here to share your story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we thank you for that. Holocaust. Because I remember. Many times in school, people will say, what do you think about the, there was the war with Iraq or something? Or the, I said, I only talk about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. or one time I was in the church, they asked me, what do I think about the abortion? I talk about the Holocaust. I, I don't get, 
you know, we, I have my opinion and I don't want to, you know, maybe insult some people even. <laughs> sure, sure. And we appreciate your candor and we appreciate that you are here to, to speak about your experience. So, 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 so thank you for that. Laura, you have a, you have a question. Yes, yes. Alice, bringing it back, you know, to your experience and can you share, you know, what you thought of humanity at the end of the Holocaust and if your views have changed since the Holocaust of humanity and, and growth from then? Yes, of course, it, it made a big influence on me. Of course, you know, uh, I was deprived. So I know if people are deprived, I have more sympathy for them. You know, I am more tolerant to, to to causes and to other unfortunate people. Oh yes, it makes a big uh, impact on you. You know, and it depends also. I tell you something. Looking back on the people, it depends when you were the Holocaust, what age you were. You know, mm. if you were young, you looked forward that you make something that you're tolerant. The older people were very bitter. Mm -hmm. It was a diff completely different approach. Mm -hmm. A little bitter, you know. And that makes me think, you know, during your talk, you mentioned your husband um, had said, you know, you have to make a life for yourself or, yeah. or the Germans have one. And you've spoken about teaching tolerance to children. And can you share what that, that journey of healing has been for you and what that was for your, your husband? Really that, that, physical journey of healing, the emotional, the spiritual, I think tying it into how we view humanity is such an important step in how we move forward um, and how we don't forget what has happened, but that we can move forward. Oh yeah, he, he moved forward, he mm -hmm. moved forward. Like I told you, the younger people like me and my husband, we moved forward, but the older ones didn't, they were bitter, you know. We, we moved forward, I told you, he always had the saying, is to be pride and and uh, purpose. You know, you have to have a purpose. You have to make a life for yourself. If not, the Germans won. But they, they, you have to move ahead. Of course, yeah. But some gave up. Some gave up. They just didn't want to. They lost their families. They lost their the husband or the wife or children. They gave up. They were bitter, bitter to the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? were not even pleasant to be with them you know mm. every time they talked they would say oh this happened you see when my husband was in company or something he never 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 talked about the holocaust mm -hmm. only if you who are asked you know mm. but then we were in other cases we were oh my god everything was and it, it was a bit they were very some of them couldn't make it through mm -hmm. no Mm. Yeah. So Ms. Alice, it depended really on the age. Mm -hmm. Sure, Miss Alice, we want to thank you for, for 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 your time today, for answering some of these questions, for your comments. Before we go, we do have closing remarks from Dr. Mary Grant, whom I would love to uh, uh, give the platform to, so that we can uh, commemorate all the lives, commemorate all the memories, commemorate you for your resiliency, for your time, for your willingness to be with us today. Um, so thank you again from all of us, Dr. Mary Grant. Okay, thank you very much, it was my pleasure. Thank you, Louise, and thank you so much, Alice, for your remarks. And before I add some thoughts, I just have to ask you one question since you are in Providence. And if this is too controversial, you don't have to answer it. Is it Red Sox or Yankees? For your baseball, is it Red Sox or Yankees? You're on mute. I can't. We can't hear your answer. Miss 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 Paula, do you mind helping unmuting? Oh yeah, Paula. Yeah. Okay. 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 So 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 you know what's going on in the house. You love yeah. the Red Sox. Tell them you love the Red Sox. Huh? Tell them you love the Red Sox. I said, I, oh, I love the Red Sox. Oh. <laughs> the Red Sox. I know every player. I don't know it. I have to learn the new, I have to learn the new players now. Yeah. I know exactly what's going on. Right. And my 
husband loved the Yankees, so you know what was going on at the house. <laughs> That's important for me to know. And so I knew that not only did you bring great joy today in helping us remember, I could spot a fellow Red Sox fan, even from a distance. Hey, <laughs> I watch every game. I watch it great. So today it's afternoon. I'm going home to watch the Red Sox. All right. <laughs> So that is one more way in which we have a shared experience and we build community. Um, and, and Alice, I wanna thank you for taking the time to be with us today and help us build community and to share. And at the beginning of today's conversation, uh, Laura, you noted that if we, don't, if we don't understand our history, if we don't have a day of remembering, we, are, we will forget and we will erase our history. And without knowing our history, we are destined to repeat it. So the history is so important. And Alice, the stories you shared today about your journey, about your resilience, about the importance of having pride and purpose, about finding something that you love, about the things that you take with you, even if it's at the end of the day, needing to have a cookie before you go to bed, because part of your story is that sense of, will there be food tomorrow? And what you have done with this and sharing your story with us today, you take us back to how Luis began this with the words of Ali Wiesel, with those who, when whoever listens is a witness and we are all witnesses today. So when we think about the generational passing, it's incumbent upon all of us who serve as witnesses to carry the story forward so that we don't forget, so that we have a responsibility to one another that we have a responsibility to help inculcate pride and purpose into others who may have lost it, that we have a responsibility to invigorate the human spirit, to ensure that evil is put in its place, to call out injustice, because when one of us suffers, we all suffer. And it is important that we remember our common humanity, our common dignity, and that we understand and practice empathy for one another because we never fully know the stories everyone carries with them because they carry them inside deeply and they form who we are intimately. And when we take the time like you did today, Alice, and you and your husband have done to share those stories, we learn, we connect, we build community and we hope to do better together. So thank you for helping us to remember because we cannot forget. And I thank all of you for joining us today. Louise, thank you for organizing this program. Laura, thank you for your poignant remarks. Laura Mulvey, thank you for your assistance. Mary O'Neill, thank you to the team who helped put this together. Thanks and gratitude. And let us never, ever, ever forget. That's cool. Let us remember that when we're sitting and watching the baseball game, our friend Alice is <laughs> doing that. <laughs> And that's a way we can continue to build joy and recover from losses too, because we break our heart with every baseball game, but we're sitting having a shared experience. And when we have those shared experience, we also share humanity. So I'm so grateful to have this time with all of you and Alice, it is a blessing. And you I'm glad. thank you for asking me. Thank, thank you for asking me, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all on behalf of the VSU community, on behalf of, of, of our moments, of these kinds of moments to continue the work, to continue to educate ourselves, to continue to remember people like Dr. Eichenbaum. Uh, we are thankful. We are thankful. We are thankful. Thank you so much. And um, I hope that this opportunity uh, is taken outside of our networks. It's shared and that we continue the work to dismantle hate in, in, in our world. So thank you so much to everyone that participated. And most importantly, thank you so much, Ms. Alice, for your time, for your candor, for your memories, uh, for keeping your husband alive in your memories. And uh, we wish you plenty of health uh, and many, many, many more years of life. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you. And if thank you, you ever all. Providence, I mean, you probably, whoever is in Providence to come and see, the whole, I have to put a push through <laughs> the Rhode Island Holocaust Museum. 
good one. I mean, it doesn't compare to Washington, but still, it has little things. <laughs> sure, like... we're going to make it there. We're going to make it there. Okay. All right. Maybe I can meet you then. <laughs> yes, we will, for sure. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Miss Alice. Thank you all. Okay. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye -bye. I'm going to see the Red Sox. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Take care. Enjoy. Thank okay. you so much. Bye-bye.